Hi everyone, my name is Steph, this is The Novelty Corner and welcome or welcome back to my channel. Today I have a Books Beside My Bed video for you where I wrap up the last seven days worth of reading. I have read nine things this week plus a couple of little other books for various projects that are coming out later this week and I have really enjoyed it. I have really not read all that much romance <laughs> at all this week, which is ironic given that we are leading up to Valentine's Day. So we shall see if I pick up any romance books over the weekend or you know, in the next week. Anyway, I've been enjoying branching out and just reading different things at the moment. I think the common denominator is that the majority of them are very short and just very different from one another. Also, before we start, Happy Lunar New Year to everyone who celebrates Happy Year of the Dragon. I am filming this on Lunar New Year's Day, but it will be going up a couple of days later, and I do have a Lunar New Year romance vlog coming out on Wednesday. So stay tuned. We are going to start with the junior slash middle fiction titles that I have read this week. So I've started rereading the Kingdom of Silk series by Glenda Millard. This is a very, like all the novels are like this short. It's a middle fiction series because it has themes that are probably a little bit more suitable for middle fiction than junior fiction readers, although it's not a complicated read at all. The first book in the series is The Naming of Tishkin Silk, which I do own, but I have lent to a colleague at work because she is thinking about reading it to her class. This is our introduction to the Silk family. They have six children, the two parents, and also the grandmother who live with them. And we are following the perspective of Griffin, who is a young boy and he has been homeschooled most of his life, but he's just started to go to school because his mother has had to go away and his baby sister has gone as well. And we, the reader, know that the baby has obviously passed away and Griffin is still dealing with unpacking that for himself. He knows, but the way that he talks about it is, is his grieving process. And the family are very tight knit and very loving and they take care of each other. They're absolutely beautiful. His mother is obviously dealing with depression and is getting help for that. So it is Griffin, his father, his grandmother, and his five older sisters all living together. And then Griffin makes a new friend, Layla, who just becomes part of the fabric of the Silk family. And their home is just warm and gorgeous and they are welcoming and they embrace the magic of play and being together. And this entire book is the family beginning to develop closure for the death of the baby, who they ultimately named Tishkin. I've talked about this book on my channel many times over the years. It is very much what well, the librarian at my school, when she recommended it to me, gave. She called it a happy, sad book because it is heartwarming and gorgeous, but there are very sad themes in the book, but just absolutely a glorious read. I was thinking about reading another book in the series to my class, and I probably still will, but I think I'm gonna hold off on it for at least half a year. I think they still need another six months before we can can read the story whose themes are different to the naming of Tishkin Silk. I am actually going to reread the whole series but so far I've reread one and three because <laughs> why would I do anything in order? The book that I was thinking about reading to them was Perry Angel's Suitcase by Glenda Millard, book three, and this one is about the Silk family fostering slash adopting a young boy called Perry Angel and he actually doesn't speak the entire time through this book and Griffin and Layla there along with everyone else in the Silk family to welcome Perry Angel to their home and this one is a really gorgeous little book. It looks at the connection between the father of the Silk family who himself was adopted and the way that he builds a relationship with Perry. Perry also features in another book in the series which is where he starts to come out of his shell but it's a gorgeous book about identity and found family and just very loving people who want to help others. Gorgeous series. All of the books have that thread of you know, sad themes through it, but an absolutely glorious found family and warm, cozy feelings because you know that everything's going to be okay. I also read Garlic and the Vampire by Brie Paulson. This is a middle fiction graphic novel. It is about Garlic, who is a sentient garlic. She lives with a witch and many other vegetables who are also sentient and who help tend to the gardens for the witch. And it's a lovely little close-knit found family as well, until the vegetables notice that there is smoke coming out of the chimney of a castle in the distance. And they begin to suspect that a vampire lives there. And they all get very frightened and Garlic, who is quite an anxious little bean, is nominated to go and get rid of the vampire because vampires don't like garlic. But when she gets there, she meets the vampire and it's the start of a really lovely friendship between everyone in the story. I Like, it's just heartwarming. It's like a hug in a graphic novel book. I absolutely loved it. I did read the Monsters in Love anthology, which was one of, which was, was it the Kindle pool? I think it might've been. No, it wasn't the Kindle pool. Oh no, it was, I had two. So yes, I read the first Monsters in Love anthology and there were some good stories in there. I'm gonna be 
kind of generic about talking about this one just because there were some stories that I really loved and there were some that I didn't. I think Cleo Evans story in the book was by far the standout. Sam Nascosta's wasn't too bad and there was another one and I've mentally blanked on the author's name but they were like they were standouts for me. They were really entertaining. This one I think had the the subtitle Lost in the Labyrinth so all of the stories had sort of these labyrinth type themes woven through them. My favorite one was about a human woman who gets locked into a library labyrinth with two orcs. Orcs? Yes, orcs. The library is owned by a dragon who is trying to keep everyone locked inside and everyone is trying to escape. The stories are very steamy. It is a, it's monster romance, it's paranormal romance, and there were some really good stories and there were some genuinely enjoyable stories. And then I think there were one or two that I just, they just went to my preference and I didn't bother reading those because I think I've got to get better in anthologies of not feeling like I have to read absolutely every story in there. I am getting better at it. It was worth reading and I do have more in the series and I am excited to continue them because I, I genuinely was excited to try some new authors and to see how they world build. So I got that out of it. I also listened to the audio of System Collapse by Martha Wells and I kind of wish I hadn't. Not because I didn't enjoy the story but because I had a really hard time concentrating on it. And I, I think I need to read the book physically first because all of the other, all of the other Murderbot Diaries books, I have all read, I've read all of them physically and then gone back to the audio and it's been excellent. I don't know, maybe it was the weekend, maybe I was doing too many things while I was trying to listen to it. So uh, I'm, I am very hazy on the details. So I did listen to it. I'm counting it as reading, but I'm going to reread it. I'm waiting for the hardback to be released here because I have the entire series in hardback. I'm collecting the Murderbot Diary series. So I'm waiting to get that particular version of the book. And I think that releases either end of this month or early March, and then I'll do a proper reread. It is nice because Murderbot has come such a long way since the first book, but there is still very much the signature humor and sardonic humor <laughs> from most of the characters. And I, and art was in the story as well, which always makes it fun. Um, but yeah, there were a few more moving parts in this one than in some of the other novellas. So I'm just, I, I think I need to read it with my eyeballs. I also read This Is How You Lose the Time War by Amal El Matar and Max Gladstone. And this is a very fascinating little book. It is about two enemies in a time war. You have red and blue and that's their names. That's how we know them. And they are forever crossing paths with each other in and out of time. And they are on opposing sides. Their sides are always trying to kill each other. But these two strike up a connection and they start communicating through various messages and a relationship develops between the two of them. It is a queer sci-fi romance, very heavy on the sci-fi. The romance is very heavily implied because these two are communic through the way these two communicate. I would content warning though, there's some body horror themes and things like that. We can tell that they're, you know, not quite human through the way that they're described and through the way they interact with the world. But if you think it's going to be a linear timeline, it's 100% not obviously time war. But it was really cool because the two are constantly trying to outwit one another and outwit their superiors as they become closer and they try to save each other's lives, which I thought was great. Like it was really enjoyable, bit head twisty at times, but great. I also got a, another collection of Maxine Benneber Clark's poetry. This is How Decent Folk Behave. And again, this is just excellent. So this is a collection of poems that Maxine Benneber Clark has written over the last couple of years. It deals with everything from the Black Lives Matter movement over in the US and its impact outside of the US to the pandemic, to all sorts of events that have happened in the last few years. She just has an incredible poetic style that I really enjoy reading and her poems challenge me and they challenge me to think about the world in different ways, to think about the privilege that I have versus what is the reality of the world. This is very much an adult poetry collection as opposed to the middle fiction poetry collection that I read from her earlier in the year. Can't recommend this enough. It is really fantastic. All right, then I read Starter Villain by John Scalzi and it has been a hot minute since I read a John Scalzi book and this did not disappoint at all. This is about Charlie whose uncle who he doesn't really know, hasn't had a relationship with since his mother's death, turns up dead and apparently has left him some kind of inheritance. Alongside this inheritance comes a few stipulations and then people start trying to kill Charlie. And it turns out that Charlie's uncle was a villain. He is mega rich. He does a lot of deals and deals in information and all sorts of things. And you know, he's got some enemies and his enemies are trying to blackmail Charlie into giving them money. But Charlie is helped along the way by his uncle's personal assistant, Matilda, who is a fantastic character. I loved her. She's got a very dry sense of humor. <laughs> 
and is trying to just upskill Charlie who has absolutely no clue about running a villain empire. And then you also have talking cats. Talking cats who have management positions in Charlie's uncle's villain empire. And uh, one of Charlie's handlers is his cat Hera. And she is an utter delight. We need more talking cats in books because this was fantastic. This pokes fun at all of those big villain tropes. I mean, even this cover is sort of a nod to both James Bond and also to Austin Powers and those big ostentatious villain characters, which Charlie is absolutely not. I should also say there's not only talking cats, but there's also talking dolphins and they are the most hilarious thing ever because they try to unionize in this book. So this is just a really fun speculative sci-fi read if you're looking for something like that. Like John Scalzi is my go-to when I just want something with a speculative or sci-fi element and a lot of humor. He does it so well. I don't know what else I can say about this book. It's just really entertaining. There's lots of explosions. And the last book that I read this week is The Body Count by Susie Anderson. This is another poetry anthology collection. This is by an Indigenous author and it is her meditations on both body and bodily autonomy but also how that relates to the Indigenous Australian connection to country. And it was beautifully written. She was the winner of the Black and White Fellowship in 2021 and this is the book that she produced. I think it was released last year. It's great. Tiny little collection. I'm really enjoying reading First Nations poetry at the moment and I'm just constantly on the lookout for more so I'm really really glad that I picked this one up. And those are the books that I've read this week. I've tried to keep this one as short and sweet as possible and I'm racing the timer before my uh, battery decides to tell me that I have used up enough time in this particular clip. Honestly, great reading week. Totally random genres for me to read in a week, but I'm highly enjoying myself. So stay tuned, who knows what's coming in future weeks. In the comments, I would love to know if you've read any of these books, if you're planning on picking any of them up, all the links for them will be down below if you wanna find out more information. If you wanna let me know that you're here, but you don't wanna leave a comment, feel free to leave a cat emoji down below. Otherwise, I hope that wherever you're in the world, you're staying safe and healthy, and I will see you in my next video. Thanks so much for watching. Bye everyone.